There's this myth about film photography that I always wanted to try. If you ever get deep into the reads about film developers, you'll find someone somewhere spouting the insane idea that you can develop film with just about anything, including the vegetables in your garden, polluted river water, and even human urine. In fact, one of the greatest photo engineers of Kodak's time, the late Grant Haste, even proliferated this myth. So I was thinking, if film developers are literally everywhere, why are we still using petrochemicals to develop our film? Because nearly every commercial film developer out there sources their primary reagents from oil and gas. And what's going to happen when this industry starts to slow down and reagents are harder to find? And if you lived through the 2010s like I did, you saw film photography almost take its last breaths over and over again. And even just this past year, there was a brief moment when we almost lost commercial film developers for both Kodak and Tetanol. What was once the bedrock of the home film photography community today stands on shaky ground with rising prices and only a select few companies reliably supplying the photography industry. A large part of this problem stems from Kodak's bankruptcy in 2012 that broke apart the company and had the different pieces sold off to third parties using shaky debt. Of course, when those companies tried to cut costs, meaning quality and reliability, the Jenga tower that they deconstructed toppled over. Thankfully, Kodak chemicals are back, and someone may be taking over Tetanol's film chemical supply chain. And there are still companies like Flick Film, Film Photography Project, Zone Imaging Lab, and Photographer's Formulary, among others, that are continuing to make film developing chemicals for the community. But just in case they ever do disappear, I wanted to see if we could create our own film developer using what's essentially just waste. Because just think, what if you're actually flushing the most valuable film developer down the toilet? If the greatest minds in film chemistry have been recirculating this fact as a party trick, it's high time that someone test it. And fortunately for you, that someone was me. Before I show you that, let's dive into some theory. And I'm going to keep this simple. If you want to learn more, there's a link just up here that will take you to a video with more information. Film developers are made by a common chemical class known as a phenol, and phenols are created and used by nearly every living organism on this planet in the form of the essential amino acid tyrosine. But phenols are also found in high quantities in berries, seeds, coffee. Essentially, if a plant has a strong scent, color, spice, or flavor, you can assume that it's chock full of polyphenols. So I went into the forest, into my kitchen, and unfortunately into my toilet to see where I could find enough phenols to develop a roll of film. I teamed up with Dimitri from Analog Cafe and Yvonne Hansen from YouTube to conduct a couple of tests. We each did our own versions, but mostly followed the same process. We collected flowers, moss, fir tree needles, two almost expired children's EpiPens from Facebook Marketplace, cedar tree bark from a freshly cut tree, urine, and still water from a pond between a garden and a parking lot, which should have multiple contaminants from both cars and fertilizers, as well as some ocean water from False Creek, which is the most polluted water in Vancouver, British Columbia. The living material was then soaked in 99% isopropyl alcohol, except for the cedar, which was used in two separate rounds of developing. One where the cedar was soaked in distilled water for two weeks, and a second round of developing where the same cedar was soaked in 99% isopropyl alcohol for three days. Yvonne tested some fresh blood that she found in a supermarket, and Dimitri tested a weird plant he found that smells like skunk, but in a strangely good way. I'll link their content down below so I don't get demonetized. Nox, imagine. Us, Nox. Oh, no, no. no, actually, uh, we're uh, friends of a serial killer. And while you're down there, make sure to like and subscribe. After collecting reagents, we shot the same photos with varying exposures on 20 short rolls of HP5 in Yvonne's studio. We had a model, Lily Li Hua, on Instagram come and help us out, and we also modeled a camera with studio lighting. We took photos ranging from four stops overexposure to four stops underexposure so that we could see the potency of the developers we collected. For this test, we erred on the side of overexposure, expecting that these developers wouldn't quite be up to par with commercial developers. For the developing step, we created a base formula for all reagents using 15 grams of washing soda and three grams of vitamin C powder which we tested without any developing reagents to create a baseline for comparison. We compared nature's formulas with caffeinol as well as Flick Film's black, white, and green developers so you can see exactly how well these do compared to other commercial developers on the market. All of the tests were developed for just 10 minutes, regardless of the developer, because for some reason, the massive dev chart doesn't yet have the developing times for EpiPens or Moss. 
That was the missing element. Now, at this point, I got to mention that we were far from perfect in these tests, and that's because we weren't looking for perfection, just for hopefully more positive results than negative results. None of us are scientists, but we controlled the variables we could with the precision tools that we had. Gonna do this over the sink. There could definitely be a bit more or less alkali in some of the comparisons, but I don't believe it'll be significant enough to swing the results one way or another. So how were the negatives? Well, as you can see, the commercial developer and Caffinol absolutely smoked the competition. The solution without a reagent, there was still some developing activity without too much fog, though the numbers and the text on the edges of the film didn't really show up. Images started appearing at ISO 400, though they didn't really develop usable density until about ISO 50, which is a full three stops of overexposure on HP5, which usually produces good negatives at ISO 800 in commercial developers. And this is exactly what I was hoping for with the base solution, because that meant that the solution did something and that this would be a perfect measuring stick that we could use to see the reagents that benefited the development and those that actively fought against it. In Dimitri's Canonal, he did two tests, one that was a standard 10 minutes and another test that was a 420 second stand development at 69 degrees Fahrenheit. And that solution developed usable though thin negatives. But the first one to actually develop the text on the edges of the frame was from the moss based developer, followed by the fir and the cedar wood soaked in alcohol. Yvonne's blood developer created negatives about on par with the Moss developer, so if you ever want to follow her lead and develop film in blood, sweat, and tears, you can expect moderate density by overexposing your film by one stop. Another interesting thing about the blood-based developer is that unlike Cedar and Moss, it didn't develop that much fog. Fog is the darkening around the edges of the film and is usually controlled by changing the amount of alkali in solution or by using a restrainer. But in general, low fog is a really good sign. That said, for this test, Yvonne used about 250 milliliters of blood, which is equivalent to about eight blood tests. So you might want to source your ketchup from the supermarket like she did. The two best developers of the set were, of course, Flick Film's Black, White, and Green developer, which had the second highest density, and the Caffinol, which created the densest negatives in the set, which might be different from what most people expected, and I think it's because the coffee was pretty strong that day. I used a formula that was meant to create one liter of solution in just 500 milliliters of water with our base formula, so that might have created a little more density and contrast than the standard formula was meant to. And of course, just to round it out, there were four tests that were actually worse than our baseline formula. And this is exactly what I wanted to see, but not necessarily in these solutions. The four solutions that failed were the ones that I truly wanted to work because these were the reagents that have been touted by the greatest minds in film photography for the last hundred years now. So it's official. You cannot develop film in human urine, epinephrine, or polluted water. They all produced results that were worse than having no developer at all. Even if there were slight images at ISO 25, I doubt anything more than fog would develop if it was left in the solution for any longer. Since they were worse than the baseline developer, it means that these reagents were actively fighting the development of the film. The seawater from False Creek also failed to create anything useful, and the whole reason that I added this one to the test was to see if it would be possible to make an all-natural monobath solution. Because you can actually use standard table salt as a film fixer, which Dimitri tested on Analog Cafe and found no fogging over the course of a year when compared with the standard fixer formulas. Unfortunately, there will not be a seawater monobath anytime soon. So what's the point of all this? What does this tell us about film photography? This whole project was inspired by the film developing cookbook by Bill Troop and Steve Anchel, which is linked below. This is the most modern and up-to-date Bible for film photographers everywhere. If there's one book that makes photography easy to understand, this is it. And it's the one that I've relied on extensively over the years, making blog posts and videos for Learn Film Photography. This project just goes to show that there is potential for making an environmentally friendly developer with the nature around you. So you can still keep shooting film even if you can't source the developers anymore. And one thing we noticed is that these developers all produced sharp images. The grain was fairly well contained, even when compared to the commercial black, white, and green developer. The reagents with the most promise from this test seem to be the fir and cedar, both of which I'm going to explore further with different tests to make it into something usable. 
The other interesting result was just how big of a difference the alcohol made in extracting the phenols from the cedar. A two-week distilled water bath extracted almost nothing, while just three days in 99% isopropyl alcohol made it the single best developer of the set. The other thing we notice is that density isn't always everything. You can have moderately dense negatives and still get usable images. That said, higher density does mean that your developer can be used to push the film. But regardless of our results, I guarantee that there are many more solutions out there that can create filmed negatives just as well as commercial developers. In fact, there's an excellent article on 35MMC by Daniel Keating, which is linked below, about the polyphenol content of fruits and spices that have significantly more polyphenols than coffee. That means you can use less of them to get better results, because caffeinol is honestly pretty expensive to make, but cloves have 70 times more polyphenols, meaning that if you need 50 grams of instant coffee, you could get away with using less than a gram of cloves to make a solution that's just as potent. The other thing that I learned from this experiment when it comes to film is that not all phenols are created equal. EpiPens are a store of epinephrine, which is a potent phenol created in the adrenal gland. Unfortunately, epinephrine was the second worst developer formula that we tested, producing next to nothing on the strip. And of course, human urine also was an abysmal developer, even though it's supposed to have a large amount of phenols, though that study that found that was done in the 1920s. So maybe the doctor had some false positives after drinking some Coca-Cola to dull his toothache. We'll never know for sure. Either way, I'll sleep better knowing that I'm not flushing the world's cheapest, most viable film developer down the toilet every single day. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please take the time to give it a like and subscribe. It really does make a huge difference and it helps me keep making videos busting the most prevalent myths in the film photography world. I've listed a few links down below for the materials we use to create our film developers. These are affiliate links to Amazon, which give me a small commission on any qualifying purchase without any cost to you. And that includes even if you don't buy the thing that I listed in the link. These links are a great way to support this channel if you already intend to make a purchase. You will also have peace of mind knowing that the products you're getting are ones that I have personally tested and had success with. So that's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.